I'm John Lear. Today is my birthday. I'm 71 years old. And everything you think you know is an immaculate deception. Flying saucers, flying discs uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin. John Lear, son of the famed aviation pioneer and a world-class pilot in his own right. As many of you may know, though, Lear the Sun is best known for his research into UFOs, a phenomenon described by some as a worldwide hoax, described by others as the most important issue of our time. I was approached by a uh, government uh, theoretical physicist employed by the government who works on the saucers up at Groom Lake. He has seen the aliens. Uh, he is tired of the cover-up. The problem is not only just the fact that there are five, to do, five and as many as ten different civilizations visiting us. Apparently, and this is from the research that I've done, at least 90% of them are hostile. Spending time with him, I just wanted to get to know him and try to suss out what is true, what is not true. Really, is any of this Bob Lazar madness? Is any of that true? That's something I wanted to know. All I can tell you is that when you find out the truth, a month from now, a year from now, two years from now, you'll look back and you'll say, my God, the son of a gun was right. Secrets, cover-ups, and strange phenomena. UFOs and ideas that challenge reality itself. All these mysteries, all this time. Are we ever going to get to the bottom of these? My name is George Knapp. I dig into news stories that others can't or won't. I'm Jeremy Corbell, and for some reason, people tell me things they probably shouldn't. And this is Weaponized. Weaponized. Here we are, weaponized, and today we're going to do a little exercise in time travel of sorts. We're going to go back to the through the mists of time to explain the evolution of a guy who became a major figure in ufology and who was, in essence, the gateway drug for both you and I into UFO world, John Lear. Yeah, man, I am so excited to do this episode because I spent so many years filming with him, a movie that never came out. People are so curious about this, so John Lear. The Godfather of Conspiracy. He loved hearing that. You he know? loved that title. You you be bequeathed that to him, right? Yeah. One time we were doing a, a, a talk, and and I just said he started cracking up with with a laugh that only John Lear has. I don't know if people know who he is, though. So we we have to kind of tell people, explain who he is. Who is John Lear? So it's possible to cover him, mention him, explain his history without necessarily endorsing at everything or anything that he said. One of the most iconic images of John Lear that really, to me, describes his personality is there he is, kicking back on the floor by a couch, and he's reading a Playboy, but it's upside down. You know? <laughs> yeah. Remember, Lazar gave that photo to us, I think, uh, to be released after John's passing. Yeah, so, so John Lear had so many, I mean, I didn't give him the term godfather of conspiracy for nothing. He was this ominous figure in this world of UFOs. And some of the stuff he said was just sound absolute lunatic style, right? However, there were things that he said that ended up being true. So it's just kind of this guy you got to take in both hands, right and left hand, and try to figure out the truth about John Lear. Well, people view him with considerable skepticism today, and that is appropriate because yeah. some of the things he said are completely outrageous. Yeah. And, and as we learned over the years, sometimes he would make claims that seemed to be designed to provoke a reaction as opposed to making a cogent argument. Yeah, I, sometimes I think he would tell me stuff just to see if I would buy it, you know, and how far he could take it. So it was really, you know, with him, it was really sifting, you know, what is true. It's like it's like mining for gold, man. You know, you're trying to figure out what is true, what is not true. And maybe he was doing the same in his life. Well, I, I've told the story before on Weaponized and in other interviews how, how he came into my world is that in 1987, he walked into the TV station with a stack of UFO documents and dropped them on the desk of my managing editor, my mentor, Ned Day. And he said, Ned, this is the biggest story in history. You got to take a look at this. It's about the UFO cover up. You, you read this. It'll be the biggest story in your life. And Ned looked at the documents, uh, read a couple of pages. They were a lot of them were UFO documents squeezed out of the government through FOIA. He pushes the pile back across the desk and says, this can't be true. If it was, I'd already know about it. 
and I was eavesdropping, as I've said before. I said, hey, John Lear, let me take a look at this stuff. And uh, that was my entry point to the UFO topic. John had credibility with KLAS, with my boss, Bob Stodall, and with Ned Day because he, who he was and what he had done before. Of course, his father, Bill Lear, had developed the Learjet, the eight-track tape. He was a brilliant man, an industrialist, who was uh, incredibly well-connected in military uh, industrial circles, had researched anti-gravity technology for a lot of years. Yes. You know? um, and, and John himself was an incredibly talented pilot. Uh, if you, you know, we both walked around in his study in his home before he passed away a year or so ago, and the, the, the photos on the walls are incredible. What a, an amazing life he had. He flew basically everything. As a young man, there's a photo of him recovering from a crash. He just about died fl flying a plane that he probably should not have been behind the wheel of at age 17, something like yeah, that. Yeah, I think it was, yeah, maybe 16 years old, 17. And he, you know, he has a photo of that plane crash and he broke almost every bone in his body. That was his first out of body experience. He, he crashes this plane and miraculously in John Lear fashion, survives, you know, but every bone in his body was basically broken. I think he wanted to carve out his own path separate from his famous father. So he became an aviator and he flew everything. He eventually was flying planes for the CIA during the Vietnam era. Right. I think he continued to fly uh, secret missions for various government entities for years, which of course made UFO people suspicious of his ultimate motives. But uh, in the uh, mid to late eighties, he developed what's known as the Lear hypothesis. He got into the UFO subject and, um, and started digging in. He used all of his military contacts and developed a pretty outrageous hypothesis. And I remember uh, putting him on the air after I got that stack of documents where he had been in the TV station, putting him on the air in a program called On the Record and, uh, and just let him go. And I look back at those clips thinking, I can see the wheels turning in my head. What the hell have I done here? As Lear spews out this incredible conspiracy theory, uh, we could take a little piece of it and, uh, and give us our audience a sense of what he was saying. Hello and welcome to On the Record. Flying saucers, extraterrestrials, monsters from outer space. The government has been telling us for years that they're not real. They're weather balloons or swamp gas or reflections from the sun or the ravings of lunatics. But serious UFO researchers say a breakthrough may be very close. You're a pilot, an airline pilot, captain. Uh, you hold, have held uh, 17 different world speed records at one time or another. You're a member of the famous Lear family that mm. all Nevadans pr are pretty much familiar with, a former state Senate candidate. You don't sound like the kind of guy who would get hooked up in something that a lot of people would say is a bunch of nonsense. No, it's just uh, by coincidence that I got really interested this about two years ago. My father saw a UFO and my brother did, and they were very interested, but there was really no proof uh, as far as I was concerned, to really uh, look into it in about, until about two years ago. Your father and, and brother saw them. Can you give details? Uh, my brother saw one. He was flying a P-38 from uh, Phoenix to Los Angeles at night. It just appeared in front of him. He made two uh, turns, 90-degree turns. It stayed in front of him and then disappeared. And uh, my father was fly flying at night, I believe, over the uh, Arizona desert and saw one, too. So you started, you got an interest because of the other members of your family. How did you start out? I had an interest, but uh, there was really nothing I could put my finger on. And like I say, two years ago, a friend of mine came through town. We had flown in Southeast Asia together, and he was retiring from the Air Force. Uh, he came over, and uh, we started talking about where he had been for the last 15 years. And he mentioned that he had been stationed at uh, Bentwaters. And I said, oh, Bentwaters, that's where the uh, uh, flying saucer supposedly was in 1980. He said, no, John, not supposedly, it was. He said, I don't care if you believe me or not, it landed. I didn't see it because we were confined to quarters, but I know people who did, and I'll give you the names, and if you ever see them, tell them you know me, and they'll tell you the whole story. Since then, I ran into one of the security police who was within 10 feet of the saucer and actually saw the three aliens get out and uh, go up to General Gordon Williams, who was the uh, wing commander at that time. Now, there was quite a bit of... Um of documentation regarding this Bentwater incident. Why don't you go into that a little bit? There's the uh, Colonel Halt memo that came out under the Freedom of Information Act, and it told about the mysterious lights and beaming down and everything that happened in the forest except the actual alien landings. That wasn't in the memo. And there was also the uh, tape, Colonel Halt tape, forest tape, 
that uh, he made over a period of eight hours. And there's a 20-minute segment that we've been able to get a hold of that uh, uh, you can hear him running through the forest and, uh, and uh, being worried, saying the thing's after us. The Air Force has made a, an art form of uh, ridiculing people who have talked about this thing. They've done an excellent job of covering it up for the last 40 years. George, basically what we're dealing with here is, I'll give you the bottom line. Okay. I'm not You're trying to sell it. I want to hear your thesis. I'm You're not trying to sell point. a book. I'm not trying to promote a lecture. This is based on what I've come across after intense uh, research in the last year. And I have found out that the government has retrieved between 10 and 15 fl actual flying saucers, three of which have been in perfect condition, one of which they tried to fly. They have between 30 and 50 alien bodies uh, in cryogenic storage. Uh, we even have the name of the uh, person whose job it is to show these bodies uh, to uh, the heads of state and the people who are authorized to see them. They represent at least five different civilizations. There's at least 9,000 cattle mutilations. Now, the government said that uh, the mutilations were normal, the, 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 your desert predator did these. But they weren't. The mutilations, they... Uh, I they think we have a picture of these somewhere. Maybe we can see that as you're talking. Uh, uh, I well, think that's the next picture. There we are. This is the mutilation. New Mexico State Police did the uh, research on, or the uh, investigation on it, and they cut out certain parts uh, with a, uh, and, and the cut was made with a laser beam far sharper than anything we have. As a matter of fact, they were able to determine that they cut between the cells and didn't cut the cells themselves. We presently don't have this kind of technology. Well, if uh, we don't know that we have this kind of technology, or you and I don't know that we don't, but that doesn't prove necessarily that it's uh, ET. No, except that uh, there's usually a, a, a visual sighting of a flying saucer or a light, a strange light, at each one of these uh, sightings. Now, the picture that we have uh, of the um, of the big head that the Air Force describes, um, this picture was drawn by an Army surgeon. Uh, these are one of the bodies that was recovered in the famous Roswell incident of 1947. Tell us about that. It was the first flying saucer that crashed uh, and was recovered by uh, the Army. It was uh, covered up. Uh, there has been several books about it. They recovered four beams, and uh, one of the uh, surgeons that was responsible for the autopsy drew that picture and, um, and uh, came up with some of these uh, um, interesting things in the autopsy. I'll just read a couple, uh, uh, three and a half to four and a half feet tall, two round eyes without pupils, no earlobes, nose is vague, uh, neck described as being thin, um, arms is described long and thin reaching down to the knee section. You can see that there's a web portion in the hands, no teeth, no apparent re reproductive organs, um, brain is capacity unknown, colorless liquid prevalent in the body without red cells, no lymphocytes. And there's more in that uh, particular report. This is but an autopsy report. Now, you said the government uh, goes to great lengths, the Air Force in particular, to discredit this kind of stuff. Where did this come from? How did you get this? Uh, that came uh, in a uh, private, uh, that came from the private collection of Leonard Stringfield, who was one of the premier researchers. He worked for the Air Force uh, in the early 50s um, uh, in a secret project reporting UFOs. Then as a civilian, he continued his uh, private research. And this is out of his collection. Why does the government want to hide this? Why doesn't the Air Force just come forward? Why doesn't, uh, you know, why don't they level with us if this is all true? Well, there's not m really much they could say based on what I've been able to find out. Uh, George, they're really, you know, what, what could they say about it? They've been researching it for uh, many, many years, and based on my information, um, let's say that the president decided to make an announcement. This is, if he made it today, this is what I think that uh, he would say. My fellow Americans, I come to you uh, before you tonight with an announcement of great importance. Despite all our denials, flying saucers do in fact exist. Where they come from, we do not know. Who is in them, we do not know. Where they are from, we do not know. Nor do we know how they got here or what they want. We are unable, unable to duplicate any of the metals found on the several craft we have recovered, nor are we able to figure out how they are propelled. We have hidden these facts from you over the past 40 years in hopes that we give you, could give you more uh, answers. Unfortunately, we are no closer to answers today than we were 40 years ago. God bless you all. In other words, you find it highly unlikely that the president would ever make a statement anything like that? No, it's just... Uh
it's too big. It's the, the mass. The, the problem is not only just the fact that there are five to do, uh, five and as many as ten different civilizations visiting us. Apparently, and this is from the research that I've done, at least ninety percent of them are hostile. And when I say hostile, uh, if not hostile, they have a completely s different set of morals than. Uh, than we do. You think 90% of these visitors are hostile. What makes you think that? Well, uh, doesn't fit with what we think of as ET, you know? We, uh, if you'll read several of these books that are on the newsstands, one is called Intruders, uh, one is called um, uh, Communion. Uh, they uh, apparently come down, and, and when I say apparently, this is taken from 300 uh, uh, hypnos uh, hypnosis cases. Uh, a friend of mine has done 140 of them. And uh, the people are abducted. They're taken up into a saucer. Usually lasts about an hour. They do all kinds of experiments. They give them shots. They poke them. They uh, they cut them. They do all kinds of things. Then wipe out their memory and send them back. Only after several months of uh, of some uh, psychological problems do they end up going to a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist, on uh, trying to find out what the problem is in the use of hypnosis, finds out that this person has been abducted. What's the reason for that? What are they trying to learn? There's three things that they're trying to do with these abductions. Uh, the first thing is they're trying to monitor us. It started in the early 40s, and they'd put a little unit, a uh, very small BB-type uh, object, way up in the back side of the brain, and they'd leave it there for about 18 years. They'd pick them up and put it in about four years old. About 12 years old, they would uh, pick them up and monitor it. Then about 18, they'd take it out. The uh, second thing they did is uh, they put a post-hypnotic suggestion. Uh, according to many of the uh, uh, people that have uh, uh, been hypnotized and, and we found out what they've told them, apparently within the next two to five years there is going to be a, a big event. Something enormous is going to happen. And these people who have been abducted, and there's probably over 100,000 of them, have been given some place to go and something to do. But under our best hypnotic techniques, we cannot find out what it is. So how do we know that that's true? Because we, they said the, they're going to do something. They know that they're going to do something, but they, under the hypnosis, they can't find out exactly what it is. And the third thing that they do is genetic experiments. They've been crossbreeding. There's a very good book uh, out now called Intruders, written by Bud Hopkins. And it's about a crossbreeding experiment with a uh, girl in Indianapolis. And they actually, the, the, um, the big head, which you call, what we call the big head in research, the little uh, three and a half foot tall with a big head, they crossbreed uh, that with uh, this girl in Indianapolis, and there were seven uh, children. And uh, just last fall, before the book was published, they brought the oldest and the youngest to show to her, and they let her name all seven. Now, this book has been thoroughly researched by Bud Hopkins, and although it sounds strange, Believe me when I tell you, you may, may not uh, you may not find out in uh, a month, a year, five years, or ten years. But you'll look back at what I'm telling you now, and you'll say to yourself, "My gosh, the son of a gun was right." Well, where's this girl now? She's just uh, living she lives on a in farm. Indianapolis. And she, she got no. She lives in town, uh, or just outside of town. She just got married. Bud went to her wedding. Uh, we all know who she is. She gets along, you know, just fine. It doesn't mean, well, just because she was adopted and gave them children doesn't mean it was the end of the world. It was just a part of her life. Uh, why don't we see a lot of photographic evidence, as many cameras and video gear? Why, why don't we see a lot of that? There are I know a lot you, of them. Before you go on, I, yeah. I know the, the pictures that we showed in the beginning of this program, you say they're baloney, they're phonies. That's right. That, uh, the pictures you showed at the beginning were the, uh, called the uh, Myers incident. It's called the visitor, the uh, visitors from Pleiades, and uh, any uh, ufologist uh, uh, worth his salt uh, knows, and who has researched that case, knows that uh, he cannot back it up with the negatives and the essential information to prove this, that something like that happened. So uh, we we look at that as uh, as uh, suspect. So in other words, you run into your share of phonies as well in your research. Absolutely, there's uh, not that many, but there are a few out there. There's so many people that have real stories to tell that uh, we're just so busy with those. The main Air Force sightings uh, were in 1975, and uh, the UFOs uh, uh, descended on every Strategic Air Command base guarding the perimeter of the northern United States. 
and uh, they hovered over the nuclear weapon storage area and they stayed there with impunity for up to two and three hours over a period of three days. And nobody heard about it? Well, the there was a few it. reports, but you really don't. I have, a, uh, I have a report 150 pages long of the F-106s that were sent out to chase them and the helicopters and notifying the Canadian authorities and the, uh, and the security patrolmen that were sent down to actually see what was going on and they'd come up on these things and they'd say, I'm not going any further. You think um, maybe I mean, it's a top secret area if the Air Force actually does have them, maybe they got him here. I'm certain they do. Uh, up at the test site there's uh, uh, a report that uh, of the three that they got in perfectly good condition, at least one is up at the test site and has flown and, and one was being flown as, as, as of 1981. By us? By us, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so man, that clip of you interviewing Lear and he just starts talking about UFOs and going through that, that went far and wide. This little show you had, people went bonkers over it. Like, is any of this true? I, I wanna come back though a little bit uh, to kind of the type of person John was so people kind of understand. So he, over all those years I filmed with him, seven years in total, from you know first clip to the last time he let me film him. One of the things that you notice, like you go through his house, he had a picture uh, where he summited the Matterhorn. He was the youngest person in history ever to do this. It's like he had something to prove his dad was so famous. His dad also started a little company you might've heard of. It ended up being called Motraola, right? So kind of like big shoes to fill, but his dad never liked the fact that he was a pilot. He goes, oh, you want to be a bus driver, you know? So he really had this contention or this contentious relationship with, with his dad. I mean, at one point he was telling me a story. He was around all these people at Learjet and his dad knocked him out. His dad punched him and knocked him out. Um, or, or I'm sorry, I probably messed that up. It, it, it was somebody else in front of his dad. Uh, but it was like, he just got a smirk from his dad. So they had this contentious relationship to the point where when they got to like the will, the, the Lear family will, John read me the will and every line after so-and-so gets this, John Lear gets nothing. John, except for John Lear so over he, and over and he over. He was like the black sheep. Yeah. He was the black sheep, man. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of other family politics and uh, and history that we probably don't need to go into that that made his relationship with his mom and his dad pretty complicated that you learned about. Yeah, of course. I mean, it, it, I think the point of this is that he was always this kind of black sheep, this outsider. It seemed like to me from what he explained, I think at the end he got a can of dog food was what was left to him. I mean, that's a message. So he had a lot to kind of prove in his life. And boy, did he do it. How many records did he get? I mean, he got so many aviation records. He got so many. He had every FAA certification on the books. The guy went for piloting and just took it over. People would come into that house. That was really crazy. One of the first weekends I was with him, he's like, they're doing something at the base for you, Jeremy. I'm like, well, what do you mean they're doing something at the base? Next thing I know, his house gets buzzed by a fighter plane. They come boom and the windows start rattling. I mean, so he had connections. I mean, the guy called the base and said, buzz my house, I wanna impress this kid, you know? It was, it was pretty funny. He was a dramatic guy, man. I know that uh, his entry point to the UFO topic was because of secret airplanes. He was part of a small group of aviation watchers uh, along with Jim Goodall, and they would go out in the desert to see what mysterious planes were flying around. They would be outside of Area 51. He took these incredible photos that, that we have ma made public before that I, I first put on the air in 1989, but no one is ever gonna get that close to Groom Lake again to take those kind of shots. It, that was incredible. So it was, it was in 1976 or 1977, and they basically went to the gates of Area 51, but there weren't gates at the time. Their security was a chain link. So in this photo that you published back in the day, you can see this chain link. So this is the way John told this story, and I think it's, it's important. Because again, these are the best photos at ground level of Area 51 the world has ever seen. They were taken in 1976 or 1977, and here's what happened. So he rolls up, he's kicking back on a cooler, drinking a beer, and he takes out his camera and he photographs a panorama of Area 51. Snap, 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 snap. And then all of a sudden he sees, you know, you can see out there in the desert when a car's coming, you see this big plume of dirt coming. He, he sees him coming. 
And he goes, oh, fuck, I know they're going to take this footage. So he was smart. What did he do? He put the footage and he rolled it up and he put it down into his ashtray, under his ashtray, filled the camera back up, took an identical set of photos. And when the, when the security got up to him, they said, oh, we know what you're doing. You got to give us the, the, the film. And he goes, in the camera? And they go, yeah, in the camera. So he pops it out, gives it to him like as if the world would never see it. But he got the imagery and he actually gave me a, a signed picture of Area 51. And it says, it's Groom Lake, you moron. Let's go Wednesday. And we did. It was his last trip out to Area 51. He wanted his, his grandson, Damien, to, to see, you know, the black mailbox, the Rachel Inn. And, you know, we were going to go up to the gates, but that's a whole nother story why we didn't. We got shaken down by Office of Naval Intelligence inside of, of the alien. But anyway, uh, we should tell the story. But anyway, at that point, we have the best images of Area 51 ever from John Lear. Well, I mean, he did some great things. The reason he got into KLAS in the first place and was able to talk to Ned and was able to uh, have a conversation that I overheard is because he had credibility with us. He and Jim Goodall would go out and sit in the desert near, uh, near Groom Lake, near Tonopah Test Range, to see what secret airplanes were flying around. They are the ones who first saw this plane that was supposedly invisible to radar that turned out to be the F-117. They gave that information to Ned and Bob Stodall, and we broke that story. It was the first uh, first reporting about the uh, what became the stealth fighter in the world. Uh, Jim Goodall had talked about uh, some of the adventures they had and how the security guys got used to seeing them outside the perimeter. Yeah, they'd, they'd check his ID and they'd see his, his, this John Lear. He was a known entity. Oh, there's John Lear again, Area 51. They're, they're aware of John Lear at Area 51. And that, again, that was in the 70s. Right. That's pretty crazy. There's a clip that Jim Goodall gave us in an interview. We'll play that now. I was 18 years old the first time I saw a black I got goosebumps just thinking about it. I was at 3.15 in the afternoon on March 10th, and I have, 1964, I have never been the same. It's love at first sight. Yes. Jim Goodall's got it bad. He was smitten more than half a century ago, and this, his 24th book, is essentially a love letter written to a machine. This is a Buck Rogers airplane that was developed in the 1950s, and you look at it today, if you knew nothing about the Blackbird, and you saw one at Nellis or you saw one at their show, I mean, you would be dumbfounded. Goodall is well known in aviation circles. For decades, he and his pals, including famed pilot John Lear, have prowled the outskirts of once obscure air bases, including Area 51 and Area 52, trying to catch a glimpse of the newest and best technology under development. But nothing has ever come close. His book chronicles how the engineers of Lockheed's legendary Skunk Works team developed the three planes in the Blackbird family, the YF-12, the A-12, and the magnificent SR-71. The first two were both flown out of Groom Lake, a.k.a. Area 51. Included in the 710 photos in the book are dozens which have never been published because of the secrecy surrounding the planes and the places they flew. I've been collecting it for stuff for 50 years. I, I literally have every, interviewed everybody from, from Kelly Johnson, Ben Rich, all the way through most of his engineers, or a lot of his engineers, all the original test pilots, all the original surviving Oxcart A-12 pilots, and a lot of the very early SR-71 pilots. My ex-wives, I've had multiple them, multiple them. Um, they said, it's, it's not a, it's not a, a hobby. It's not a passion, it's, it's an obsession. Skunk Works engineers had to design and build from scratch a spy plane that could cruise at 2,100 miles per hour up at 80 to 90,000 feet. They did it in a mere 32 months using slide rules instead of computers. The planes proved an invaluable tool during the Cold War. Hostile adversaries tried to shoot them down but never did, though Blackbird pilots knew the risks every time they took off. They built 50 Blackbirds total. And, and over that, the 25 to the 30 years that they were operational, they crashed 20 of them. They crashed three Blackbirds in 10 days in 1967. Because it was a black program, the press and general public didn't know anything about it. The SR-71 still holds many aviation records. It flew from the west coast to the east coast 
in one hour and seven minutes, that's in excess of 2,100 miles per hour, there is likely a project flying around out there that could beat that record, but whatever it is, it's still classified. Jim Goodall managed to acquire an SR-71 himself, though finagle might be a better word you can hear. <laughs> so it was while researching these secret planes and making contacts with people inside the military, inside intelligence agencies, that John Lear first got on the trail of UFOs. And those documents that he had shared with KLAS were enough to convince me to put him on the air. And the response from the public, as I've said before, was outrageous. It was totally unexpected that it touched the pulse of the public in a way that I did not understand. So I started digging in. And John was so instrumental and so helpful in guiding me through the strange world of ufology back in those days. He had file after file of documents, official documents and reports that, uh, you know, I would never have been able to obtain on my own. It was so helpful and, and really put me on the road to pursuing the paper trail, which is really the the slice of the topic that got me interested. D didn't he run for political position? Yeah, state Senate. He ran for state Senate. So he was a decorated pilot. He'd worked for the CIA. He had a great family name and had run for office. So yeah, he was deemed a credible person in the eyes of the news media in those days. All those years hanging out with John, sleeping on his dirty floor until they finally gave me a bedroom because I was there so much. Um, people would come from all around the world just to spend a moment with John. And I didn't really understand why. Like, you know, people from Area 51, people from the stealth program, pilots, just to see the awards that he had, everything he'd done in his life. So separate from UFOs, before any of that entered John Lear's life, he was this uh, kind of legend in the aviation field, not just because, because of his father, not just because of Lear Jet, but because of what he had achieved in aviation, which was so cool. And then, you know, of course, along the lines, there were a lot of whistleblowers. There were a lot of secrets. There were a lot of people coming to him saying, I, I was in the room one time and someone was saying, I'm, I'm going to die soon. I got like stage four cancer. I'm going to die soon. I just want you to know some things, John. And they spilled the beans to what they had kind of witnessed or experienced out at the test site, out at Area 51. So you imagine there's a guy sitting there hearing all these kind of deathbed confessions, like right there at his epic desk with all of his monitors. I mean, if you're talking about something that looks like conspiracy, John Lear's lair is what we used to call it, just looked like the classic conspiracy theorist. I mean, monitors after monitors. It was just such a wild environment. He's such a kind of wild guy. So yeah, he became sort of like UFO Elvis, in a sense, people would make a pilgrimage to his home to tell him stories and John would absorb it all. Yeah. But he didn't seem to have a filter. I mean, you know, some of the stuff that he absorbed, he spits right back out as if it's gospel. And, you know, over the years, as we knew him, the, the tales, the claims he would make became increasingly outrageous. I, I remember. So the first time that I met Bob Lazar it was it was not, uh, you know, because I tried to. I was just there filming at John's. And John goes, Jeremy, Bob's coming over today. Get your cameras ready. And I go, <laughs> he talked like that. And I'm like, uh, John, I think that's a little inappropriate. I would like to you know, hear from Bob. I'm going to put all the cameras away and then we'll talk. But what was so funny, Bob let me turn the cameras on. That's how we got a little bit more from Bob at that time. He was like, during that time that, that Bob was there with John, you could see John was like, provoking Bob, like there's a billion people living on the sun. I mean, he would just say these crazy 93 things. 93 races, 93 Na different races, yeah. alien races living on the sun. <laughs> 93 alien races living on the sun. And, and there's Bob being like, holy shit, John, you can't possibly believe this stuff. I mean, they were, it was like John was trying to provoke Bob, you know? That dynamic is pretty interesting. And I think the, the UFO public has a, a different uh, understanding of what it really was. Uh, people see Lear as the Svengali pulling the strings and controlling the Lazar narrative, which is not exactly how it happened at all. I remember uh, Lear had told me in late 1988 that he knew a guy who had just been hired out at Area 51, and he expected to have more information soon. Then in May, of May 15th, 1989, we do this interview with the guy who eventually became Bob Lazar, who was identified in that as uh, Dennis, a pseudonym. It had been arranged through Lear. We had called Lear, hey, is your UFO guy from Area 51, is he available to do an interview? And within an hour and a half or so, we had it set up. It happened at Lear's house. We sent our live unit up there. Lazar takes a seat. We black out his face in the live unit in front of Lear's house. And out comes this story. People have asked the question, how in the world 
does um, does Bob Lazar get a clearance or get hired to work out at uh, S4 near Area 51 if he knows John Lear? And and uh, that's a really interesting question. I don't have the answer to, but Bob was asked about Lear at, at his initial interviews, you recall. Yeah, that that's something that is really bizarre. So look, I, I understand the idea that people don't believe Bob Lazar. Like, I, I totally get that. Like if you, if you don't, if you haven't lived it like you've lived it, or you haven't been like in those rooms when the calls were being made and you spent years doing that, you you could see this idea that John Lear, who's like a UFO guy, you know, manipulates the situation to do this long con for what, like 35 plus years now. The thing is they can't coordinate when they're, you know, coffee pots, electric coffee pots are gonna go off. Like if you really saw the situation, it, there's no possible way that they could coordinate some kind of long con together. They didn't always agree. Everybody didn't always like each other in, these, in this little group of people that were experiencing what you guys experienced with Bob. So it's it's almost comical to me that, that Lear would be this mastermind of this modern day UFO thing. There, there've been a lot of things that have been misunderstood. So for example, let's talk about the Krill paper. I know this yeah. is really the right. niche thing, but there was this paper that came out from uh, O.M. Krill. O.H. Krill. O.H. Krill. Original hostage Krill. Original hostage Krill. <laughs> and everybody still puts this out over the internet and, and they say, oh, look at this. This is a description of what's going on with the aliens. John Lear wrote that. He admitted to writing that. He said that was the best estimate kind of of what is going on from his perspective. But that was taken on the internet as that like gospel, some kind of leak. And, and we, we know some people, some conspiracy people propagated that like, Bill Cooper. Bill Cooper. Bill Cooper. So the second time I, I interviewed Lear three times on this on the record program, and each time I interviewed him, the response was even bigger. The third time he came on, he brought this guy, Bill Cooper, with him, who was claimed to have read certain UFO related documents while he was in the Navy. The Navy. He was going to go underground. He was going to tell his story and disappear. And of course, he didn't. He became this huge UFO celebrity. Suddenly, people are paying a hundred bucks a head to have dinner with him. He wrote a book called Beyond the Pale Horse, Behold, Behold the pale. a Pale Horse, which a lot of people think should be titled be Behold a Pale of Horse Shit because <laughs> it was so outrageous, it is the most stolen book, I think, in America. It's the most popular book in prisons in America. And it's Bill Cooper's UFO conspiracy manifesto that became more outrageous. He and Lear became sort of attached at the hip for a long time. We'll talk about how that um, uh, relationship dissolved over the over the years but uh, they spoke together and uh, and they were on some interview program talking about OH Krill as you said that Lear had made up and there's Bill Cooper saying yeah I read about this in the US Navy I saw these documents and Lear leans over to him and says Bill no you didn't we made that up don't you remember oh no 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 it, it's completely real which tells you a lot about Bill Cooper yeah, yeah, that was a funny story because I had read that book. You know, it's a total conspiracy book, but I had read it when I was a kid, just checking it out. When John told me that story, that's when he said he knew Bill Cooper kind of drank the Kool Aid, that, that he's a liar, was that he was sitting there in that interview, like you said, and just was like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? We wrote that. So that created so much confusion in, in the UFO world and the conspiracy world. How but bizarre. It caused a big fallout between those two. Yeah. I mean, it was part of the reason. And then uh, Cooper drank a lot in those days, I guess, and became increasingly erratic. And there was a falling out between he and John. I remember hearing a threat that Cooper had left on his uh, answer machine. It was pretty serious and uh, um, scary. Yeah, yeah. They were not friends at the end of that, that, that relationship, you know. Um, but, you know, with, with Lear, things were never simple. They, they were always complicated. I remember that the first time that, that I went to Lear's house, I, I might've told this before, but I was there just trying to learn about UFOs and you know, no one was really accessible. And, and after some time, Lear got back to me. So I jumped on a plane, I flew out there and it was like for two days, he let me film with him. And the first question I asked, I think I have this on camera. First question is, what is the best evidence you have for UFOs? Can you show it to me right now? It's like super naive. I thought this was like such a simple thing. Show me the best evidence. <laughs> and he just kind of like looked at me through the barrel of his cigar at his computer and he just didn't say a word. And it was like that for two days. He didn't talk to me. He just kind of would look at me and glare. And I don't know if he was testing me. Is this kid for real? Does he really want to know or what? 
Obviously, there's no one piece of best evidence with UFOs, but then he opened up, started spilling the beans on his life story. That's what intrigued me so much to, to well, I wanted to make a film about him. I wanted to document his life. And was that your entry point when you get to stay with him for a couple of days? You're saying, I want to make a film about you. Yeah, kind of. I mean, again, I, 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 like, I didn't know how to use a camera. I, it's arguably, I still don't know how to use a camera, but it was, my pitch was this, man. I want to know the truth, not just about Bob Lazar, but what you know. I, I just want to know the truth. This is the nexus point to, to the whole UFO mythology or, or story. So I, I just wanted to know. And so I said, look, I'm not a filmmaker. I actually, his business manager pulled me aside, which would be his wife, Merrily, right? And was like, what are you trying to do here? And I'm like, I just want to film, document. I'm not going to twist anything. I'm not going to try to make him look crazy. I just want to document it, make a film. I haven't made a film yet, but I, I intend to one day. And I think this is a great place to start. You stayed at his house. I remember that was sort of how you got into talking to me. That was part of the reason why I answered the phone calls, your persistent phone calls. It's because you were working on something with uh, with Lear. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's less than a mile from where I live, you know, in his, his home. And you're there all the time. And you're not just filming. You're fixing plumbing. You're <laughs> fixing his computer. You're doing whatever he needed, right? You're, uh, yeah. Well, OK. So part of the cost. To my admit to to my admission into the the UFO world was that yeah I think he used me to like smuggle him cigars and bad food and like yeah and then I did fix a toilet once <laughs> but it was like yeah I mean look he he was already older at that point like during our years of filming he actually flatlined at one point so he was not in great health um, maybe he just wanted a friend but he really was spilling the beans he let me sleep on his floor at first for a while. Um, then, you know, finally they let me actually stay in a bed, but it was like, just, I wanted to invest myself. I went out every weekend for years, every weekend. Can you imagine being my wife and be like, where are you going again? Hanging out with my old friend, John Lear, the conspiracy guy. I mean, I, I had to be a little crazy to do that, but yeah, spending time with him. I just wanted to get to know him and try to suss out what is true. What is not true. It's just a hologram that we're living in uh, really limited as to, um, Time travel is, uh, it, we can't do it. We're in a hologram. This is just a uh, entity, a space where we're learning how to uh, navigate our soul. Really, is any of this Bob Lazar madness, is any of that true? That's something I wanted to know. On a personal level, tell me about Bob as a friend to you. Yeah, Bob Lazar is uh, my best friend. He lives in Michigan now, but he used to live across town. I met him in 1988, and we got to be good friends. When I first met him, he wouldn't hear of any talk about flying saucers. He knew for a fact that they did not exist because he worked at Los Alamos National Laboratories, and he had a Q clearance. And if there had been something like that, he would have known about it. I think people uh, get confused about the sequence of events and how it happened that Lear was m manipulating the situation or creating the scenario, which isn't how it happened at all. I mean, we put him on those shows on on the record. Little did I know that two guys named Bob Lazar and Gene Huff had paid attention to it. And, and uh, when the time came for Lazar to come forward, he came to me because of those interviews with Lear. He had, uh, I guess, Gene Huff, who was a real estate appraiser, had gone to Lear's home to do an appraisal and got into a conversation about UFOs. And that eventually led to an introduction to Bob, who was not a UFO guy, did not believe it, didn't believe any of it. At okay, that time. Let's, let's really explain that. Because again, it's like, if I hadn't spent years every weekend filming with Lear and getting to know you and meeting everybody and hearing and being in the room when calls were made, I would be like everybody else. I would have this like, different layer of skepticism about if like Lazar is telling the truth. What you just said is so important. And everybody in this small group of people, Bob Lazar thought UFOs was bullshit. He thought he actually one time to, to our buddy, Jim Goodall, uh, Jim Goodall, they're driving away from Lear's house. And Bob says something to the effect of, man, I really feel bad for Lear. He comes from such a prominent family. You know, he's an accomplished guy. And Jim Goodall's like, what do you mean you feel bad for him? And he goes, well, he believes all that UFO bullshit. So for me, that was like, to really get to know people 
that were involved at that time, to me, that was like, oh, wow, like Bob was completely thought the UFO thing was nonsense. And there he is, you know, kind of becoming friends with John Lear, who's this crazy conspiracy theorist in, in some people's eyes, including Bob's at the time, right? But boy, did that change. Well, we told that story, told Lazar's story, November 1989, it comes out, it explodes. The whole world beats a path to Area 51's door. I think John Lear enjoyed the attention. He enjoyed the idea that people thought he was responsible for the whole thing spilling out. He did a lot of interviews, his profile was raised. People would make the pilgrimage to his house to, to get the real inside story and, and he dug it. And as time went on though, as you know, his stories became wilder and wilder. I mean, the 93 different alien races living on the sun, that was a pretty good one. The secret tunnel from the Luxor Hotel to Area 51 and, and all through the Southwest, that was another one. Uh, the secret base at near Wendover, he said, uh, it, the, one of the last interviews I did with him, there's a secret base out there and when you approach it, fly in at night, it opens up like a zipper and then you land and then they zip it back up and it disappears again. I'd see people come in and tell John's stories, right? And like you said, he kind of had no filter at that point. I guess it, once you've seen or experienced the extraordinary, maybe you just get rid of that filter. But I think you're right. There was a point with John Lear where, to me, it appeared like he just didn't have a filter for the for the conspiracy. He was like, well, if that's true, everything else is true. I, I don't know. So he believed a lot of things that for me, there's there's no evidence for. But again, he was right there at each moment and, and certain things ended up being true. And that's what's so amazing about his story. It's true. I mean, you know, the F-117 and other planes that he first acquired evidence about and then made public, he and Jim Goodall and a couple of others. The story about, uh, about Bob Lazar and the craft that were flying out there on Wednesday night. He went out there three times in a row with Lazar to see it. John Lear went out there and I actually have footage from one of their excursions where, you know, John's just messing around and, and it's just, they're out by the car, but he, he went out there to see the craft that Bob Lazar said would be flying over Papoose Lake, not over Area 51. I mean, nobody knew about this back then. Ready? Yeah. Good evening. This is John Lear and today is March 22nd, 1989. We're standing just about uh, eight miles due east of Groom Lake, Nevada, the super government uh, secret test site. And just a few minutes ago, we saw one of the government uh, uh, extraterrestrial UFOs fly over there. Uh, we all watched it for about uh, <clears throat> seven or eight minutes. Right here, I have my Celestron scope. Uh, it's eight uh, inches. And I had, uh, uh, had it focused in for about 15 seconds and saw for myself that, in fact, it was a disk. We're going to uh, uh, stay here for another couple hours here to see if we can show you folks uh, an actual uh, extraterrestrial flying saucer being uh, flown by the government. So if you just stand by and uh, we'll be looking over that mountain, which is where they are. They also come over here, which is over at Bald Mountain. There's some lights over there, which you can't see, but they are a number of trucks. We don't know whether they're looking down here or <clears throat> what they're doing up there. But we managed to get in here. Uh, we're standing on public land. It's uh, completely legal where we are. And if you'd like to uh, come here later in the show, we'll tell you exactly how to get here. Well, you can mention who's with you, John. Uh, we have Bob Lazar, and we have um, Jackie uh, Lazar, Bob's wife, and we have Jean Huff. And this mission was organized tonight uh, by Bob Lazar, who is a, uh, a uh, uh, theoretical physicist who works at Groom Light. <laughs> And is also a dead man at this point. <laughs> <laughs> We're having this on film. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm happy. You want your name on there. That you're <laughs> yeah. We're out here with the late Bob Lazar. <laughs> takes out John Lear and they see it. And in fact, there's this really kind of famous clip now where right after they see this, this craft, they're kind of joking and they're out there, but they see a UFO right where Bob Lazar said they would. And it was zipping around and doing all this stuff. And there's John doing a stand up in the middle of the desert at night, you know, kind of with his buddies being like, oh, Bobby, Bobby Lazar is going to jail. You know, it was kind of funny. And that same night after they filmed the UFO and after John does that kind of stand up in the dark of night in the desert, they got stopped. Do you, do you want yeah, to tell that story? Yeah, they got No, go ahead. That, that's amazing. So the way that everybody's described it to me is they think everything's cool. They're in the middle of the desert. We got away with it. We were there. We filmed. And all of a sudden, they hear something fall and start to roll, and it's a little green light. 
What it was, was like they were surrounded by people in darkness, and that was a night vision that dropped and rolled. They had no idea all these people were around them. And so they got held at gunpoint. What are you guys doing out here? All this stuff. And that's when Bob had to give his name. So Bob gave his name, and oh, man, like that was bad. That was like the next day Bob gets called out by Dennis Mariani, and he gets, which base do they go to? It's Papoose. Oh, no, uh, Indian Springs. Indian Springs. Indian Springs Springs. is now Creech. Creech, yeah. yeah. Indian Springs then, now Creech. But that's when Bob got taken in and basically poked in his chest and screamed, you don't know what you've just done because he showed people the test flights. That actually happened. That happened. And that's what people don't really understand. You're not going to take some nobody who's making stuff up, take them to a military base and do that. So everybody thought at that point, that was the turning point. Yeah, that was March of 1989. um, And Bob became worried that he was going to be killed. So two months later, when I just happened to reach out and say, hey, would that UFO guy uh, do an interview? It, the timing was right for him. And, I, you know, I don't care anymore whether people believe Lazar or not. I certainly don't care whether they believe Lear or not, because Lear made some outrageous claims. But we're just reviewing a life of a really interesting character. You spent seven years going to his house almost every weekend shooting and uh, video and recording interviews, and you got better at it. Some of that stuff that you shot toward the end of his life is really beautiful. You're going to make a film. And people ask, where is it? So where is it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, God, I'm going to cry. It's like a bittersweet episode. Uh, it's hard for me to, to do this episode, actually. I, I loved John Lear. You know, he, I, I did. I, I cared about him a lot. And uh, I actually even made like a trailer for this movie. I, I put out a short like episode number one of, of, you know, of the John Lear experience, maybe 20 minutes. Um, what happened is really this, man. I, I'm, I'm, I wasn't a real filmmaker. I don't know what that means. Uh, we had an agreement. And the agreement was I would invest all this time and this money doing this, you know, mainly my time. And that we would do this. And I, with his life story, bang, I put it out. But I think it got too tempting or something when they saw like, damn, he's actually making a movie. So what actually ended up happening is, I'll just put it this way. His life rights were not given to me by that point. So it was kind of like, I felt like I was being held hostage. Like, I can't make this movie now because somebody else has been signed over to maybe on a napkin or something, the life rights. Is it just one somebody or multiple somebodies that he gave life rights to? I, you know, (laughs) your guess is as good as mine, but it was just, it was weird. It was like a self-sabotage because I know he wanted me to make a movie about him. I know he wanted that. that. At the core, he wanted that. But I think it was too tempting to see if they could extort me. I, I don't know. I don't want to say it in a bad way, but I felt extorted. Well, I see it in a bad way in the sense that you spent that much time, shot all that video. John wanted a movie made. And in the end, you could not make it because other people claim the rights. They would claim ownership of whatever you produced. Um, and then that led to a split with you and Lear, right? I mean, at the end of his life, you guys were not in a good place. A, a, a bad split. And, and, it make, and it makes me sad. Like he was so uh, kind of angry at me that I didn't make this movie. And then to put, you know, icing on the cake there, I ended up making the Bob Lazar movie. I think that way. And, and I tried, I tried to include him, but I think that that split was just too much. And, you know, I kind of feel like he was half joking. Like if I really got in a room with him after all that, it's like, John, you motherfucker. You know, he might've just busted out one of his big ass laughs, but, and he kind of said it to me, he goes, this is what we're up against. When he showed me that somebody else was in control of his life rights at the point, this is what we're up against. So he was kind of still with me, but I think it was just too much at that time. He wanted his story to be told. I wanted to tell it, but I was unable, and and I I am unable at this point to put that together. I knew him for 36 years, 35, 36 years, and I spent some time with him the last couple of years of his life, not talking about UFOs, but talking about his health challenges. He had some, you know, there were a lot of injuries from aircraft uh, accidents, but other health uh, issues that developed. He was in bad shape over those years. And the insurance companies were giving him a bad time. He had financial problems. It was a sad story toward the end, yeah, yeah. you know. I, I, mentally, he, he was there. He was always so sharp. That's the thing about John. He was always so sharp, man. But yeah, I think the physicality of what was going on with him, um, yeah, he was just, 
Yeah, he still had the greatest sense of humor though, man. I, I'll tell you a story that I heard. So he and Bob had this like little uh, riff. They're, they're doing like pranks on each other at one point. And uh, at one point, he did something to Bob that was like really bad, a really bad prank. So I think Bob went to his pool and threw in some sort of dye pack to turn the entire pool yellow. Marilee started packing her gun. She said, I'm gonna kill that motherfucker. So they had this like really fun relationship. John always maintained this just hilarious, I've never laughed so much as those years that I hung out with Lear. He had a great sense of humor, man. Well, he had a great life, uh, interesting life. He accomplished a lot. He became the godfather of conspiracy. You, you know, you're looking back at it, you can't take him seriously, can't take him at his word for some of the claims that he made, but he did influence the evolution of modern UFO world in the sense of the pivotal role he played in the Lazar story, Area 51, and others. Um, you know, and I think, again, not to beat a dead horse here, but the idea that Lear created this whole thing, that he was the mastermind behind it, that he created it, is just simply not true. John Lear couldn't mastermind a sandwich. Like, you know, it's so funny, man. It, it's just... Um, you know, another funny story is, you know, when you're into this UFO thing and you got loved ones around you, sometimes they think you might be stepping over the precipice. So there were times in John Lear's life where Merrily, his wife, was like, that's it. No more of this nonsense. I am taking all your files. We're locking them up. That's it. And she's told me about that. That all changed one day when Merrily saw a UFO for herself. She gives him back everything, says, okay. I saw it, I actually have that on camera. It's really cool of Marilee, um, you know, talking about her UFO experience. I was here working in the Rose Garden and my eight-year-old daughter comes through that back gate and says, what is that, mom, a UFO? And she's pointing this way. And I look up and there's a UFO coming right over the mountain. You can see the top of Sunrise Mountain uh, behind. And as I looked up, there was another one, which she hadn't seen because she was running in with her friend. Uh, there was another one coming in behind it and traveling at unbelievable speed. I would say, <laughs> you see the two palm trees here? I would say it would have been as big from here between those two palm trees. Our guys were had to be flying those things. There was no purpose of them flying over a populated area. As many as they have up at the Area 51, um, of course our guys are going to try, you know, try them out, fly them. Um, I know Lazar was developing a, uh, a name for the fuel that they use, and did. Um, I believe it's called something 15, but you know, that's not in my area. <laughs> that's in John's area. <laughs> but uh, like I said, it's really, really been interesting married to this man. I miss John. He passed away more than a year ago. We recently, uh, there was an event that was scheduled for the Las Vegas area, uh, uh, an attempt to appropriately disperse his ashes. It didn't happen, but it's going to happen at some point. Yeah, for sure. That, so that was cool. So we got to go uh, to Vegas and we, and we got to meet up with John. We were going to blow up John. Sorry, we got to go meet up with Bob and we were going to blow up John Lear's ashes. That would that would be on a dry lake, but that would be an appropriate send off for a man like him. Um, yeah, look, he, in in this field, John Lear is a legend for a reason, which is that whether or not the things he said were true or untrue, what he brought to that attention, you know, to to the world's attention, he was the guy that like I first kind of heard about, like that was that was really looking into this. So I, I really respect what he did. Again. Half of what he said or more, you got to kind of put to the side. I think the lasting image uh, from your time with him is him smoking a cigar in his den, in his office. My lasting image in my head is John Lear sort of commanding the troops out at the dry lake bed 
during Desert Blast, these outlaw firework shows that somehow got organized out there. I know he was involved in creating the fireworks and then he would be the, like the commander on the scene of this incredible three-day orgy of explosives. Uh, that's the image that sticks in my head. Right, so Desert Blast was this uh, big kind of, I don't know what you call it, it was Burning Man before Burning Man, but a lot more guns, liquor, and women than like a normal Burning Man, I think. Uh, but yeah, so John Lear would be, he'd be in Bob Lazar's garage, like making illegal fireworks to take out. And normally they'd bust them, but a lot of ATF agents were like, would go to the event themselves. So that was called Desert Blast. And that was something that Bob Lazar put on. So yeah, Lear, you, I've got images of him like shooting guns out there and doing all that. Um, just, just wild, man. Just a wild person, wild times. Yeah, I so we're talking about it. It's not, we're not endorsing the claims that he made. We're explaining what an interesting character he was. That's what we're going to do occasionally on Weaponize is go back through UFO history and tell people who they were. And, and how critical he, he was to kind of exposing the very beginning of the document trail and all this stuff and getting you involved into the UFO thing. So he did a, a big service to kind of bring this information out, whether we have to sift it or not, which we do. Um, he really, John Lear is pivotal to the public consciousness of Area 51 from the first photos that he ever took at Area 51 that, that it still remain historic to this day. Man, he lives on just through just through what a character he was. Yeah, we miss him, but it's great, great memory. I mean, it's great to recall these memories about him. Yeah, yeah, T totally missed the guy. He was a son of a bitch, but he was our friend, the son of a bitch, John Lear. So he would love the fact we're talking about him right Absolutely. now. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. All right, man. Thank you, man. Never have so few had so much to tell, but could say so little. Follow and listen to Weaponized, a presentation of Jeremy Corbell, George Knapp, Dark Horse Entertainment, and Cadence 13 Studios. Available now for free on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your shows.